Okay, good morning. This is uh, another colloquium from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia under the Severo Ochoa program. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Julia de Leon from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. And she will talk about the last results on Osiris Rex, results on a mission to understand the planetary system. Dr. De Leon will be introduced by uh, Isabel Marquez, our scientific director. Isabel, please. Hello. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for thank you all for for attending the web lacum today, and thanks also for, to our speaker for accepting our invitation to contribute to the online colloquia in our Severo Ochoa uh, program at the IAA here in in Granada. Our invited speaker, Julia De Leon, is a researcher. is a, uh, distinguished researcher, as translated from uh, in Investigador Distinguido, at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canaria. She uh, obtained her degree in physics at the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, and, her, and then her PhD in astrophysics at the IAC in the Canary Islands in 2009. Then she spent three years here with us in, in Granada, the IAA, uh, as a postdoc, to work with data from, uh, uh, from the OSIRIS instrument on board the Rosetta mission. She is uh, currently leading the Solar System Group and is a representative of the research line on exoplanetary system, systems and solar system at the IAC with the IAC Severatoire program. And her research focuses on the physical and compositional properties of asteroids, and in particular on those that get close to the Earth. She is actively involved in current space missions to study minor bodies of the solar system, like the OSIRIS-REx from NASA or uh, Ayabusa 2 from JAXA, and also in future missions from NASA like Lucy and Sika. She is also chair uh, of the Remote Observations Working Group of the ESA Hera mission for planetary defense. Dr. De Leon is currently leading the IEC participation in two European uh, Horizon 2020 projects, near Rocks and NeoMap, specifically dedicated to study uh, near, near Earth asteroids. She has published more than 75 papers in international peer reviewed uh, journals and presented more than 150 contributions to national and international meetings. She has uh, been a member of the Spanish Anopticon Time Allocation Committees, TAC, and she is currently a member of the TAC of the Jabalambre and Montsec Observatories. She has a wide observational observation experience and also teaching experience, in fact, having supervised already two PhDs uh, and two master students. She's also very active in outreach activities like Hint of Science, Asteroid Day. Uh, Cosmo Educando, Fundación Starlight, Habla con Ellas, Mujeres en Astronomy, so Women in Astronomy, etc. And today, as uh, René said, uh, she's talking about Osiris Rex, uh, telling us the results on a mission to understand planetary systems. Uh, thank you very much, very much, Julia. I hope that uh, this invitation will be transformed to, into a, uh, transforming the virtual into a, a in person one in, in the future when, when possible. And, and thanks again. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers for this invitation. Uh, it's an honor for me and I hope you, you enjoy it. Um, when I was asked about uh, doing this talk on results on the Silas Rex mission, um, I tried to summarize all the uh, results that this amazing mission, I have to say, have been, uh, has been providing. And um, I, I must confess that the results that I'm presenting are a little bit biased against the, my backgrounds because I'm more focused on the composition of asteroids. So um, sorry about that, I apologize in advance. But, uh, but yeah, that's what, uh, what I'm going to be presenting. Um, well, this is the first NASA mission to collect a sample of uh, material from the surface of an asteroid, but it's not the first. Uh, mission to do that. Um, actually, it was the um, uh, Japanese Sailor Space Exploration Agency or JAXA uh, agency um, who did the first sample return uh, with his Hayabusa mission, which was uh, launched in 2003 and visited the asteroid uh, Itokawa, which is an 
a Skype, I will explain a little bit later what is the, this means. Basically, it's a, it's a rock. Um, it's a very small asteroid, it's about 300, 350 meters in the longest axis. And as I said, this is the first sample return mission ever. Um, the mission was um, more or less a success because it failed a little bit uh, during the acquisition maneuver. And um, the spacecraft was only able to collect uh, just a few, less than a, less than a gram of material in the, about 1,000, 2,000 particles of less than one millimeter. But in any case, the capsule returned safely to, to Earth. You can see a picture here of the uh, Hayabusa team engineers collecting the, the sample uh, here in the capsule. Uh, you, I think you can see my, my mouse, my pointer. And, uh, and yeah, and, and they, they spend, I would say, years analyzing these little uh, particles using um, many techniques in the laboratory. Uh, here you can see an uh, electron microscope uh, image. For example, this is one of the brains of the um, surface of Aitukawa. So considering this, um, let's say, failure in the acquisition of the, of the sample, uh, the JAXA agency decided to, um, to launch in 2014 the Hayabusa 2. This time they visited a um, carbonaceous-like or a C-type asteroid uh, named Ryugu, a little bit larger and with a different shape. This is an image obtained by the spacecraft. It's about 870 meters. And they successfully collected material this, this time um, in, the, in um, last year and in February last year in 2020. And actually, the, you can see here some images. This is a video of uh, the first attempt uh, to collect the, the material. Once the spacecraft uh, went a, a little bit away, they observed that they were um, uh, moving uh, the surface uh, material of the, of the asteroid. And they discovered that uh, the material that was uh, uh, liberated or moved um, seemed to be to have a different albedo, a different uh, reflectance, so might be indicating different composition. And they decided to do a second attempt to collect uh, more material. This uh, um, this mission has been also um, amazing in terms of engineer. They were um, it was a very successful one. Uh, they also deployed uh, um, some little robots, the Minerva two, on the surface of the asteroid, which were jumping. And taking pictures of the of the asteroid. Here you can see one of the, the, the images obtained by this Minerva two robots, and uh, and the, and the capsule has uh, successfully arrived on Earth. It was recovered in December, last December, uh, from uh, the Woomera region in in Australia. Here you have an image uh, of uh, one of the engineers of the team of the Hayabusa two team, and um, and the capsule, which is. It's been currently analyzed in the laboratories, as far as I know. Um, so this Hayabusa 2 mission was launched about uh, two years before the launch of the Cytus Rex. And I have to say that it's been a an, an, an very uh, good example of how the collaboration between the two uh, missions has um, enhanced the scientific return. We've been exchanging results and comparing results. And I think uh, this has been very, very beneficial for, for the two teams, for the Hayabusa 2 and the Osiris Rex. So this being said, uh, we go for the Osiris Rex mission, which is, as I mentioned, is the first sample return mission to an asteroid um, for NASA. Um, it's been the third mission that was selected in, within the frame of the NASA New Frontiers program, uh, which aims to explore the solar system with a medium class spacecraft mission and, and do high science return uh, research uh, to add um, uh, info to our understanding on, of the solar system. So these are uh, the two main pillars of the, of the mission. So to reveal a solar system history and also to study uh, an asteroid which 
as you know, might um, this object might impact uh, the Earth. They constitute an impact hazard, and so the second pillar was a mit mitigation of the impact hazard. I will explain this a little bit uh, uh, later. Um, the other missions within the New Frontiers program are the New Horizons that visited Pluto, uh, Juno uh, visited Jupiter, and uh, the Dragonfly, which is planned to visit the Titan, which is a Saturn's moon, and in, will be its schedule for launch in 2026. So Osiris Rex uh, stands for, Osiris stands actually for, uh, I, will, I will read for the acronym, so, so O for the origins, as it's, it, the main aim is to return and analyze a pristine carbon-rich asteroid sample, spectral interpretation, so it provides ground truth, direct observations for telescopic data of the entire asteroid population, as we will be able to compare what we get from the ground with our telescopes and what we get from in situ observations. A resource identification to map the chemistry and mineralogy of a primitive carbon rich asteroid and uh, security because it's observing and measuring um, properties of uh, an asteroid considered a potentially hazardous asteroid. I will explain what this means in case we need to, to deflect it. And Regolith Explorer to, to document the, the regoliths or the material as, um, on small scales uh, and sampling the size that scales down to the sub-centimeter um, uh, scale. So, um, this is Osiris Rex, and it's, um, as I said, it contributes to the NASA sample return legacy. Um, we re they return uh, samples of the moon with the Apollo missions to study the um, provided information on the origins of the Earth and, and the moon itself. And uh, the uh, samples from, well, solar wind uh, particles in the Genesis mission, which provided information on the composition of, of the sun, samples from the comet, wild two comet with the Stardust mission, and also some from uh, interstellar particles. And now, and to, to close this uh, picture, uh, Osiris Rex, which is providing samples from an asteroid and, and will give us information on uh, early solar system um, to be analyzed in the laboratory. Uh, the target of the Osiris Rex is an asteroid. Asteroids are mainly uh, concentrated between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter in the inner solar system. Um, this picture here is uh, like a cenital view of the ecliptic plane with the planets and the sun in the center. So this is Mars and this is Jupiter. All these green dots are main belt asteroids. This is what we call the main belt where the majority of the asteroids are located. And the green uh, dots are the near Earth asteroids, which basically originate in the um, asteroid belt and uh, where asteroids um, get close to some regions that are unstable uh, because of the gravitational uh, influence of Jupiter mainly, but also from Mars. And uh, when an object, when an asteroid gets close to these uh, instabilities, uh, the, uh, its uh, orbit gets um, uh, altered or excited. So from a mostly circular orbit, it gets to highly eccentric orbits and it also its inclination, its orbital inclination is modified. And they uh, get um, they they um, get close to the Earth. That's why we call it near Earth asteroids. Um, there are other populations like um, well, the Jupiter Trojans, for example. There's two clouds here orbiting um, with Jupiter, always at the same distance from Jupiter, in what we call L5 and L4 um, Lagrange points. But uh, the most um, interesting uh, population for us is a near Earth uh, population because uh, as these asteroids get close to the orbit of the Earth, uh, are um, accessible to a spacecraft. So the selection process, as it can be see here, it can be see here. Sorry, uh, starting from okay, we go for an asteroid, more than half a million asteroids uh, in the main belt, but we, we focus on the near Earth because they get close to the Earth. So it's much simpler to, to access them from, from with the spacecraft. 
So by the time this selection was um, made, there were about 7,000 asteroids. From those, uh, about 200 uh, had uh, orbits that were optimal for a sample return. So these are mostly trajectory and dynamical constraints from the spacecraft. And uh, the team wanted to uh, observe or uh, to study objects that were not too small because um, small asteroids typically rotate very fast and they have like, um, like tumbling rotations. So they do not uh, spin over one axis, but over several axes. And this complicates a lot um, the, 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 the spacecraft and maneuvers and stability, et cetera. So those uh, with diameters larger than 200 meters, just the uh, two dozens, 20 something. And from those, the, the, the scientists were interested in, in visiting a carbon rich asteroid, uh, in contrast to the uh, S type of rocky asteroid that was already visited by, by the Hayabusa mission. Uh, so that uh, ended up in five candidates, and from those five, the Bennu was the one that uh, was better characterized by the time of doing the selection, so they went for, uh, for Bennu. Also, Bennu is a potentially hazardous asteroid, as I mentioned before, or PHA, you will see this, this letters a lot, uh, which are defined uh, basically uh, with two criteria. So if their orbit uh, uh, get uh, them too close to the Earth, as close as this parameter, a minimum orbit intersection distance, which is basically the closest distance from the orb in the orbit from the object to the Earth. If it's um, 0 0.05 astronomical units or, or below, and this is about 20 times the mean distance from the Earth to the Moon. To give you an idea. So if the orbit of the asteroid uh, gets it as close as this or even less and its diameter is larger than 140-150 meters then it's considered a potentially hazardous because in the event of this uh, uh, asteroid of this size uh, of impact uh, us if the, of impacting the earth uh, they will uh, produce um, uh, um, it will it won't be a catastrophic uh, like uh, like a, a global uh, event but uh, on a regional scale okay so um, as I said um, we wanted to observe an, an carbonaceous or a C type asteroid um, in contrast to um, the S type asteroids what are S type asteroids is um, asteroids S stands for stony and it's related to its composition. There's a taxonomy related to the composition of asteroids. So S-type asteroids are mainly rocks in the sense that they are composed of um, basically of anhydrous silicates like pirate sand or olivine. And those um, silicates that you can find also here on the Earth. And, and these materials, these silicates have very characteristic absorption features and they're visible to near infrared spectrum. So from 0.5 to 2.5 microns mainly. And the characteristic absorption bands at one micron and two microns. And they have very bright surfaces with albedos being larger than 15 or 20%. So in contrast, uh, you have the, what we call the primitive asteroids or carbonaceous like asteroids. We call them primitive because they resemble uh, carbonaceous chondrites, which are uh, half the compositions that are um, uh, very similar to the uh, compositions that we uh, think that were present in the early stages of the solar system. That's why we call them primitive. So the primitive asteroids uh, are dark. They have very low albedo, so less than 10% typically. And they, in contrast to the S-type asteroids, they present featureless spectra in the visible to near infrared wavelength region. Here you can see it. This is a typical C-type asteroid. And they have a spectra, as I said, similar to carbonaceous chondrites, which are the meteorites that um, are uh, rich in carbon compounds, in organic compounds, and also in and hydrated mineral phases like uh, phyllosilicates. Phyllosilicates are basically 
silicates that uh, have uh, their crystal structure modified because of the action of uh, liquid water uh, during um, thousands of years. And in this way, they, they, they are very interesting because they might have the clues to understand how um, water and organics got um, to the earlier and how life began in, in our Earth. So that's why we um, are so interested in primitive asteroids. That's why the Hayabusa 2 mission is targeting a primitive asteroid and the Osiris-Rex is targeting a primitive asteroid. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the target was, um, the designation was the, the typical designation of the of asteroids, which is the year that they are discovered, in this case, 1999, and um, a set of letters and numbers, which indicates the month and the week of the year, and then the, the order of the detection in, in that day, the asteroid detection. So 1999 RQ-36, was soon uh, designated with an, um, um, a number. Um, well, th this happens when we got uh, enough observations to have uh, uh, to know the orbit of the asteroid with a lot of precision. So the, the number was 101.955. And finally, it, um, as it was selected as the target of this mission, it was given a name, which is much easier. <laughs> And uh, as the mission was called Osiris, um, Osiris Rex, um, the, the name was uh, selected was Bennu, which is an Egyptian mythological bird um, born from the heart of Osiris and as associated with the sun and the creation and renewal. And then the name was proposed by a third grade student, uh, Michael Pulsio, and it was selected in an international contest by the Planetary Society. So this is uh, Bennu. So as we do for all the asteroids that are targets of the space mission, what we try to do is to get as much information as possible and to characterize it as much as possible from the ground uh, before the, the, the launch of the mission, because this will help defining the, the instruments and, and, and also the, um, um, the instrumental configuration, the filters, et cetera. Uh, this, are, this is the, the orbit of the, of the asteroid. You can see here, as I say, it's a near Earth asteroid, it's an Apollo, so it crosses the orbit of the Earth. And uh, these are the radar images that were obtained from the Ares uh, radar and the Goldstone radar in 1999, when it was discovered, and also in 2005, with uh, which we, would, uh, we were able to, uh, from light curves, from, from photometry, to infer a uh, shape. This is a model of the shape, and, and it's in very good agreement with the images obtained from the spacecraft, so we did very well. So we were able to determine its size, so about um, um, about 500 meters, more or less. Its shape, which was a spheroidal, its rotation state, also it rotates every uh, four hours, more or less. The bulk density, this is done by comparison with the, with the meteorites. The albedo, it's very dark. It reflects uh, less than 5% of the sun that, uh, that it's... Um, gets to its surface. And the spectral type, it's a B-type, which is a, a primitive object, but with a blue spectral slope, negative spectral slope in the visible, as you can see here. So it's very featureless in the visible to near infrared. This upturn here is due to, to thermal excess because it's a near Earth and it gets close to the sun, so it's, um, it's heated. Uh, OK. Uh, we, our group is contributing to the mission mainly to with the, with the spectra, as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, we are uh, mainly uh, interested in the composition. You infer composition from the spectra. So we did the, we observed the target, the visible wavelengths, and we study it in the frame of, uh, of a survey of B-type asteroids, other B-type asteroids that we did. And also we did a study on the origin of the dynamical origin of the asteroid, what part of the main belt it came from uh, in collaboration with the professor Umberto Campins uh, that was um, a member of the mission and he nominated us as members of the missions and that's how we accessed the mission. So Javier Licander and Juan Luis Rizos, which was our former student, he did his PhD with the Osiris uh, Rex data. 
Edith Atsumi, who is a postdoc. Um, she's also, uh, she's co eye of the um, cameras on board the Hayabusa 2 mission. So thanks to her, we have also access to the Hayabusa 2 data. And myself, and we are all part of the image processing working group, which is in charge of the, of the cameras of the mission. Well, I think I'm already late. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is uh, the payload, the instruments. Uh, it has a set of uh, cameras, polycam, map cam, with a set of four filters in the visible. Uh, here you have the wavelengths. These are the B, V, uh, W, and uh, X filters. The W filter is centered in 0.7 uh, micron because uh, some phyllosilicates, I don't reach phyllosilicates, and uh, have an absorption band at this wavelength. So we wanted to detect it if present. And the panchromatic filter, a wider filter for the pancam uh, uh, camera, and, and the SAMCAM uh, camera to uh, obtain images of the sample uh, acquisition mechanism. So with this, we obtain the color images, uh, but it also has on board an spectrograph of VIRS uh, for the spectral maps from the visible to the near infrared to 4.3 microns. OATS, which is a thermal emission spectrometer to provide the measurements of temperature uh, in the infrared, the thermal infrared up to 100 microns. Uh, the OLA, which is a laser altimeter, um, is a scanning LIDAR to provide high resolution topographical maps. And with this, we, we do the, um, the digital elevation models and the shape models. And REXIS is a um, regolith X-ray imaging spectrometer, which measures X-ray fluorescence line emission from the surface of the asteroid. It's a student experiment from MIT and Harvard. Uh, and also some um, instruments um, specifically devoted for the sample collection, like the TACSAM, which is a touch and go sample acquisition mechanism uh, with a sampler head with an articulated arm. This is the size of the sampler head. It's about 32 centimeters, and this is a three centimeters. So the particles need to be at least less than two and a half, three centimeters to get really um, to be acquired by the sample head. The sample return capsule is a container uh, with a heat shield and the parachute because the capsule will be the only thing that will be actually returning to Earth. It will enter the Earth and will be recovered. And then also some navigation instruments like the guidance, navigation, and control, um, a lighter for um, to, for navigation using asteroid surface, and the tech cams, uh, the two redundant cameras um, that help in the navigation that uh, are also mainly devoted to uh, get images of the um, of the capsule. Okay, this was the launch. I think you cannot hear the video. It's basically me shouting like crazy. I had the opportunity and the luck to attend the, the launch in September 2016 from the Cabo Cañaveral Air, Air Force Station, I will say it in Spanish, and the NASA Kennedy Space Center. The launch was more than perfect. Everything went smooth and no issues, no problems. The good weather, it was a fantastic uh, experience. Um, so this is the timeline. It was launched in 2016. In one year uh, later, it did its first uh, Earth gravitational assistance maneuver, uh, an Earth flyby, and it, uh, the cameras obtained the color map images from the um, Earth and also from the Moon that were used as calibration images. Um, in August 2018, the approach phase uh, began, and that's when the, the spacecraft uh, reached the asteroid. So these are the images um, obtained by, by the polycam of the asteroid, actually. We were still very far away from the asteroid, but the approaching phase started, and in December, we arrived at the asteroid. So the preliminary survey started, the arrival, this lasted three weeks and we did like five hyperbolic flybys, three on the Northern hemisphere, one in the equator and another one in the South hemisphere of Bennu. And after this, 
we entered into orbit, orbital A. This was in the last day of December in 2018 and it was the transition phase. Here you can see the animation. So, um, as I said, this was in uh, December 2018. So the, uh, the mission already uh, during this uh, approach phase and this preliminary survey obtained the first images of the, of the asteroid, which were really surprising. It was a completely field of huge rocks. We were not expecting this at all. I will comment on this later. And it affected a lot on the, on the planning of the mission. Um, this is a timeline. I will go a little bit fast through it because I'm already over time, I think. Um, as I say, the detailed survey, uh, which was um, a period when um, we did a full, um, uh, full observation of, um, of, the, of the asteroid, obtaining images of uh, every um, every region of the asteroid with the different um, instruments to get the um, science and, and to obtain the temperature maps, the polar maps, etc., and the topographic maps, etc. Um, and at the end of this, of this detailed survey, the team had all the information needed to select the, the sample collection site. Uh, by the end of uh, 2019, the orbital B um, started, which were getting closer and closer to the asteroid and getting images uh, with high resolution and with more detail of the, uh, fine, the, the four final sample collection sites and in order to decide which one was going to be the primary sample selection site. And, uh, and we, these images were also part of the natural feature tracking uh, which I'm going to talk up a little bit later about this, but they were uh, key to um, the acquisition of the sample. Um, 2020 we was mainly devoted to um, reconnaissance uh, maneuvers over the uh, primary and the backup sample collection size at very, very uh, close distances, um, like uh, 250 meters, getting images in very detail and very uh, high resolution, um, and to decide um, and on the on the um, maneuver that was going to be uh, prepared to acquire the sample. Uh, of course, we did a couple of rehearsals of this maneuver of the tag uh, between April and August, and finally in October, in the 20 October. Uh, we did this touch and go uh, maneuver with success where the sampler head was extended with an arm. The arm is about three meter long and push it against the surface for about five seconds. And at contact, um, we had a, like a bottle of uh, nitrogen gas and, and was blew onto the surface and lifting the material that was recovered by the, the, by the head. Here you can see an animation on how this worked. And now the the um, spacecraft is drifting away from Bennu and um, it will return, it will start the returning, the return cruise phase in March, um, next month, a couple of months, sorry, um, and we will arrive um, in 2023, in September 2023. So uh, regarding the results, uh, most of the predicted results from Bennu match the findings very well in terms of global properties and, and the diameter, uh, volume, surface area, bulk density, mass, as you can see in this column, we have the pre and contour results and the results obtained from the uh, data collected from the OSIRIS-REx. Um, in terms of composition also, there were no, well, there were some surprises, but more or less in general, um, the agreement was very good. The albedo is very similar. Um, thermal inertia also, etc. But, um, well, here I'm going to show you some of the results. Uh, this is, for example, a color map obtained with MapCam with these four filters that I mentioned earlier. And this is a false color image where red is the ratio between the X and V filters. So this gives you an idea of the, uh, of how the slope uh, how red or blue is the slope uh, to longer wavelengths in the visible. The green is basically the 
strength of a potential absorption band at 0.7 microns. And you can see some very marginal detection of this absorption band. And uh, the, the, the blue channel will go for the ultraviolets. And it's a ratio between the uh, B and V filters. So overall, this gives you an idea uh, of the, the, the bluer or the color of the redder that are the features in the, in the surface of Penu, which is overall uh, blue. It has a blue slope. And, and we see some uh, a very, um, uh, we see a correlation or a, or a trend uh, between the brightness and the colors. So those areas that are darker are uh, normally red and the other way around, so brighter are uh, bluer. And uh, we believe that, uh, so analyzing the colors of the boulders and the craters, et cetera, it's kind of complicated to find a simple uh, relation between um, age and how long have this material been exposed to the effects of the impact or impacts of micrometeorites on the solar wind uh, particles, etc., which is uh, called the space weathering. So, as I as I said, it's uh, it's a complicated history, uh, and it has to be um, tentatively explained using the two-step process for the space weathering. So, um, as we do not have uh, really in this wavelength region absorption bands or anything that we can really measure, um, it's very very complex to to say or to explain how the exposition to this space weathering is affecting uh, the color of the different color units that we observe at the, at the uh, in Ben. Um, we are also doing um, analysis of uh, map cam colors, uh, color images, but using a different technique. This is the work from the thesis work from our student, from Juan Luis Rizos who uh, was applying a clustering technique. So it's an unsupervised technique, uh, which is able to take all the millions of pixels of the surface and to find uh, a number of representative um, uh, groups, a number of groups that are representative of all the um, spectra that we can observe. So this, each point is the, is the uh, reflectance at each of the filters, so B, V, on W and X. So this is kind of a very, very low resolution spectrum. And what we find is basically in agreement with the, what this has been found by the rest of the team, by the IPWG uh, members uh, of the team, and is in good agreement. We also observe some uh, a trend between um, how bright or dark are, is a boulder and how blue and red uh, is a spectrum of that boulder, for example. Um, other interesting results are the identification of hydrated minerals over the surface of uh, Bennu. They are everywhere, and they, as I mentioned, in the visible and to near infrared up to 2.5 microns. The spectrum of Bennu in red is the one from the ground based telescopes, and in black is the one from the OVIRS uh, instrument on board the spacecraft. They agree very well. And uh, um, the absorption bands uh, that are diagnostic of the presence of phyllosilicates are in the three micron region. It's just very complicated to observe on the ground because of the atmosphere of the Earth. And we detect an absorption band here, very, very clear, very intense, uh, which is attributed to um, um, hydroxide ions, it's OH in, in clays and, and phyllosilicates, the serpentine group mainly. So the spectrum are very similar, the spectrum of the average spectrum of Bennu, it's similar to the spectrum of uh, carbonaceous chondrites. And the best match is with the CM2, uh, which are one of the most accurately altered uh, types of meteorites. So uh, the, if we go to longer wavelengths, uh, the spectrum from oats in the thermal infrared, uh, also it agrees very well with the CM chondrites. We observe some crystals and features due to silicates here. Uh, although there are some things that we were not able to explain, like the absence of this very characteristic uh, absorption here, um, attributable to uh, magnesium um, uh, rich phyllosilicates. So 
it could be explained by the presence of iron rich phyllosilicates, although we do not see this 0.7 micron absorption band associated with iron rich phyllosilicates. So uh, it is not uh, clear why this is not uh, present in the spectrum of Bennett. And uh, we also see some features here at these wavelengths that are tentatively associated to the presence of magnetite, which is a subproduct of the of uh, water alteration and, and my, it's present in up to 10% in the matrix of some uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So it could be uh, present also on the surface of, of Bennu, but it's not, not clear enough. Um, also some interesting results like uh, the presence of some very bright veins here. This half image in the images of the surroundings of the primary um, sampling site. Uh, we observe uh, um, this type of veins. This is only an example, but we have observed it in many, many uh, boulders on, on Bennu. And it's very interesting. They have been uh, observed in detail when, with uh, OVIRS, with a spectrograph, and it presents an absorption at 3.4 microns, which is uh, observed in, um, in carbonates. Okay, so mainly calcite, but also dolomite and magnesite, other types of carbonates. And, and this tells uh, interesting things about the history of the aquatic alteration history of the of the asteroid. And, and the time, the, the parent body of this near-Earth asteroid was uh, presumably in contact with water that was creating these carbonates, and etc. So very interesting result. Some unexpected surprises, although um, uh, this was, I, I would say this was one of a big surprise. This was completely unexpected. Um, Farah Hergon Rothe, which is a member of the team, was basically routinely uh, checking images of Ben during the orbital A. This was in January 2019. And uh, one of the things that the, he liked to check was the background stars against the asteroid, because some of the stars were used to, uh, for navigation proposals. So he, um, he had uh, his eyes so used to the background stars that he uh, realized by simply looking at the images that there were uh, like a group of stars that were not supposed to be there, kind of a cluster or something. And when he was analyzing the images and, and he applied some, um, some filters to remove this part of the asteroid because it's very bright, he discovered that they were not uh, stars, but particles. So this was the first time ever that a particle ejection event was discovered on an asteroid. And it ended up that uh, checking the images from December, um, we observed more than 300 events between December and February. This is 2019, sorry. Uh, the particles were ranging in size from less than a centimeter to up to 10 centimeters. And most of the particles um, that were ejected returned back and falling back on the surface. And part of them were simply uh, away from the asteroid and others get entered into orbit before going back into, onto the surface. This was very exciting, very unexpected. And, and actually it, uh, we, we managed to convince the engineers and the operations team, and the Lockheed Martin, to uh, add an additional orbit to what was planned. This was very, very, very hard to, to convince them. And we did a, an extra uh, orbit. It was called orbit orbital C to uh, observe venue in the proper, in the um, uh, optimal illumination conditions to detect more events. And we actually detected more events. Another surprise that we detected on the surface of Bennu, it was uh, the presence of some spots, bright spots on the overall dark surface. Remember that the, the surface of Bennu reflects only up to 5% of the light that is uh, incident. And then we detected some very, very bright material with up to 25% of the light reflection. So it was very bright. So we went uh, to, the, to this, um, uh, boulders, the sprite boulders, and obtaining a spectrum, and we discovered that they presented this typical one micron and two micron absorption bands associated with pyroxene, with basaltic material. 
So the explanation is that uh, somehow, we don't know exactly how, um, this uh, um, material comes from uh, asteroid uh, Vesta, which is a basaltic uh, asteroid that is um, um, in the surroundings, in the vicinity of, of Penu. So um, this was very, very, very exciting discovery, very unexpected and it had some implications on the formation of uh, Bennu itself and the parent body of Bennu. Um, we are uh, in our group uh, um, extending this discovery. And in this previous work, they present only six bright boulders, but we did an exhaustive search for more bright boulders, discovering about 100. They are level here over the surface of Bennu. This is a, a paper that is in preparation um, by our postdoc, by Eri. And here are some examples of different, even uh, morphological types of boulders and having bright material. It's a very interesting result. And another interesting result is that the team of the High Episode 2 also discovered bright boulders on the surface of Ryugo, which is an, another low albedo dark asteroid. Um, here you can see some images of the bright spots of the bright boulders. And this work was published by Eri Tetsumi also uh, this year. And they, the two papers appeared uh, simultaneously, the one with Bennu results and the one with Ryugu results. Although in this case, the uh, boulders were a little bit less brighter than those observed in, in Bennu. And the composition was more like an S-type, uh, so more like mixtures of pyroxene and olivine. Um, similar to um, ordinary chondrites. So the origin of this um, bright material is slightly different from the origin um, of the bright material in, in Bengal. So another very important unexpected result and unexpected surprise uh, was that the, the surface of Ryugu, of Bennu, sorry, the ground-based observations in the thermal infrared and in the, with the radar from, from telescopes in the ground and well, also from the space telescope, they did some observations, but this suggested that like a smooth surface, that's what we expected to, to find when we get to Bennu, um, like, uh, like sun in the beach, okay, so covered by centimeter scale particles. Um, like um, yeah, like pebbles to the maximum. And then when we got there, we discovered that <laughs> the surface of Penu was really rough. It was completely covered by boulders of different sizes and well, uh, not pebbles, but very large uh, boulders and no regolith, no fine dust particles covering the surface. And we have, uh, the mission, uh, we have designed the mission and the sample head and everything and the maneuver to get them sample, assuming that we will find at least uh, an area of 50 meters uh, free of boulders and covered by the fine dust. And that was not the case. So this was the first uh, big surprise and this affected a lot on the planning and on the way everything was uh, prepared to get the sample actually. So it took us a lot to identify um, some, pro, some um, good sites to get the sample, mainly because of the, of the safety requirements. When looking for a sample uh, collection site, we uh, look at mainly for safety for the spacecraft, so no big boulders around. Uh, then the second criterion, the second um, constraint was the sampleability. So Let's go to a place where we find um, particles uh, smaller than three centimeters because that's the space that we have. If you remember that image that I put at the beginning of the, of the talk of the sampler head. So the, the, the um, space that we got to, to get the particles was three centimeters. So um, then the availability, which means um, it has to be a site so the spacecraft can go, get close to the surface and go back. Um, and the very last point was the science value. Well, this is, was not a problem because all the surface was more or less homogeneous. We were finding the same materials all over the surface. So uh, selecting a sampling site became a little bit more complex 
and stressing, I have to say. I, we as a group participated in the analysis of all the surveys and creation of the global maps and the in, in analysis of the detailed survey images. And we ended up with five regions of interest, which are here. Sampling sites with fine grain, what we suppose was fine grain, and free of hazards. So each of these boxes is about 50 meters, which was the initial requirement for the navigation or guidance security. And here you have it more in detail. Nightingale, Osprey, Sunpiper, and Kingfisher were the four, the final four. And after um, um, a month or two of, um, of analysis and debate within the group, we finally selected Nightingale as a primary and Osprey as a secondary or the backup sampling site. So this is Nightingale. Uh, this is uh, the size of uh, the spacecraft. And you, from this uh, distance, this is a 40, 14 meters box. So you might think, okay, this is a very fine grain. But when you get closer, um, so these rocks here are these rocks here. It is, it is really not that, not as fine as we expected. It's, um, we, we can see some people, this is the size of a bicycle. So this will get you an idea of the, of the area. And, uh, um, and we went for a, a nightingale. Here you can see a video of the, of the sample acquisition. So remember this head is about 30 centimeters. So you can, you might have an idea of the sizes of the particles here. And uh, another interesting thing is that the, the operations team uh, had to um, invent a system or something to, for the spacecraft to be able to do this maneuver with the automat autonomously because there's a lag of uh, about 16, um, 18 minutes more or less for the signal uh, from the ground to the, to the spacecraft the radio signal to get uh, up and down. So uh, everything needed to be um, like a sequence of commands and the spacecraft had to do this autonomously. And what they did was for the guidance, uh, they obtained a lot of images during the previous surveys, the, all the phases uh, of the uh, Nightingale and with the very high resolution images and they created kind of a catalog, like a natural uh, feature tracking images catalog. So the, the spacecraft behaved like a human eye. So it was uh, continuously comparing, obtained the, the uh, images obtained on time uh, with the catalog images and doing small corrections. If this border needs to be here, and in my catalog, it's here. So I do a little bit, uh, a little shift. The precision of this procedure was about 40 centimeters, which is crazy. And, and we did it uh, when, no issues, nothing went wrong. Um, this is an, an image of the, of the header where we can actually see some particles escaping. Um, if you have questions later, I will explain why these are escaping because it was, this was supposed to be sealed, but it was not. So uh, the, the sample was finally stored. Uh, here, this is the entering capsule. And you can see an animation. These are real, real images. Um, and now, the as I said, um, the spacecraft is uh, basically going, um, waiting on, until um, the, um, it gets uh, to the point where it can really start the um, return cruise uh, phase to go back to Earth. And I think this is all. I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for this talk. Applauses. And now the talk is open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand. You can do that pressing in the bottom, in the menu button, in the bottom, reactions, and then you can raise your hand there. And I give you the word in order. Do I stop sharing or? 
as you want, maybe, no? Maybe in case I need yeah, some support, exactly. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can start with uh, one question. Maybe you know uh, about the V-type, the basaltic uh, particles that you found in the surface of the asteroid Bennu. Uh, I get surprised that you can find it, but I do not get surprised that they are there. Uh, I think all the near space, uh, near Earth space, maybe is filled with a lot of kind of uh, particles. And one of them can be the basaltic type from Vesta. So if we have a, a basaltic type in the asteroid belt, also in the near Earth space, also as a meteorite, we, we need to have a lot of dust of basaltic uh, particles in the nearest space. And Bennu is there and is collecting all these particles and we can find in the in the surface, maybe. This is a, an explanation. I think we are um, inclined more to the other explanation, like uh, this bright material was um, in the parent body. So as you know, most of the near Earth asteroids, because of their size, they are not primary bodies. They they originate from a catastrophic disruption of a larger body. It generates these fragments. And these fragments are then accessing the near Earth space. So we believe that uh, most likely this uh, material was in the parent body of of Ben, because of some of the bright materials are um, really uh, like appear as some of them appear as veins in the in the rocks in some boulders so um it's not uh, typical of um, um so this this is not how this bright material would appear if it was uh, due to an okay. impact of a bright maybe i'm not explaining myself but I yeah know. yeah but all the bright materials are al basaltic uh, all the, the ones that we detected on venue yes we have yes. to say that uh, um, all the ones that were we were able to observe with the spectrograph, because we have images of bright, material, bright spots all over the, the surface, but not all of them uh, have been able to uh, being observed by the spectra, which which is the the proper way to confirm right. um, basaltic origin. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have another question, Pablo. Hello, Julia. Can Hi, Paula. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you? Thank Hi. you very much, for, for, first of all, for, for the really nice talk about this amazing mission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have two, two questions. One is just uh, curious about the, the albedos that you provide, the, the whole albedo of the asteroid that you say is uh, around 4.5%, and the other albedos of the, of the bright uh, regions of the asteroid. Uh, are there are these uh, V albedos or R albedos? Uh, you mean the filter? Oh, no. Ah, okay. Yes. These are measured with the V filter. V filter. Okay. Okay. Which yes. is the one that we have in the in the in the, the camera. camera? Yes. Okay. okay. And another question. I have read uh, this this week that. Is there the possibility that, that Osiris Rex uh, will visit the asteroid, the near asteroid Apophis? Do, do you have more information about, about that? It's a kind uh, of, of the mission. It's an extended mission. That's, yes. you know, that uh, as the spacecraft will keep <laughs> flying and only the sample return capsule will enter the air. Uh, they have decided, I think this is already official, I'm not sure because you know these NASA things, you never know when you are able to, <laughs> to announce anything or this has been recorded, but yeah, yeah, um, we are planning to visit Apophis um, as an extended mission, as another target of, uh, of, the, of the mission once um, the, the capsule returns to Earth. Um, I think this is official and it's not announced. Sorry, NASA. <laughs> as, you are, as you are not paying me, you cannot fire me. So. <laughs> I, I, I think the date is for 
2029 or something. Something I mean, about that's when Apophis will do the close approach, I guess. 2029. Yes. Yes. I'm. 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 Uh, in a. I don't know. It's a group of observers that uh, are trying now to characterize and to get uh, more data because Apophis is getting closer now. Also this year. And we want to observe it. And actually, we've been obtaining light curves from the telescopes here in the in the El Bloque de las Muchachas Observatory. And I have requested some observations with the Grand Account. So, yeah. Yes, for sure. We'll, we'll be we'll be worried right this 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 visit. I, I it's a wait. very interesting target. Yes. 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 So thank you Julia, and congratulations again for for your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, we have another question by Adriano. Please go on. All friends. <laughs> Hi, Adriano. Good to see you. Your micro is off, Adriano. Yeah, you're muted. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. OK, thanks, Julia, for your talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, you show that there, there are particles coming off the surface of uh, Bennu. Uh, are they more or less evenly uh, distributed? The, 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 the ejection of these particles is more or less evenly distributed, or do they come from specific places? So, um, the, I, I, I said here that we observed about 300 events. Uh, these 300 events uh, are more or less evenly distributed. There is no not a preference. And, uh, but I have to mention that uh, I think I read in the paper that uh, the three largest events that generated the largest number of particles were all in the um, um, mid, um, so in the evening uh, of the of the asteroid in, in terms of this uh, local local sort of time so and also uh, after a few days after the um, asteroid uh, passed through its perihelion which is also interesting so uh -huh. the the hypothesis that we prefer to explain the origin of these events is this thermal uh, cracking due to uh -huh. differences in the temperature of this uh, of the rocks on the surface that uh, might be uh, liberating some of these, some of the water embedded in these phyllosilicates or whatever. And this might be generating these fragments. But this, these are very tiny, tiny pieces, tiny particles. And the mechanism is not clear yet. Yeah. But this is our preference. Uh -huh. I have another question. Is there an estimate of how much material you managed to pick up? We have an estimation, as you know, the maneuver that was devoted to really have a good estimation was canceled because it was a planet that we will measure the momentum of the of the spacecraft uh, by extending the arm and rotating the spacecraft in the axis perpendicular to the arm uh, and to measure the inertia or the velocity of the of this uh, turning and compare this maneuver with the same maneuver, but with a capsule full of material. And this will give you a better estimate of the, of the uh, material that was inside. But uh, as I mentioned, the, the ceiling uh, flap that uh, was supposed to be closer uh, to prevent escaping of the particles, uh, it seems that it was not because these images, the images of the head uh, show with us that some of the particles were actually escaping. So this uh, made the team to decide, okay, forget about this maneuver and do the stow, close, close it and save the particles because they appear to be escaping. But from the images, uh, we, we are pretty sure that we have more than 60 grams and the best, the most optimistic of the, uh, um, estimations go up to two kilograms, but we will see. But for sure, we, we feel the, requir the requirement of 60 grams. It's more than 60 grams for sure. Good, thank you. Thank you, Adriano. Uh, thank you. Now, Max, please. Yes, thank you, Julia, for a very interesting talk. 
Um, I'm Max from the observatory in Nice. I work with Benoit Cari. Um, and I was, uh, my question is a bit like Adriano's, but not the spatial variation of these particle ejecta, but the temporal one. Um, is this a continuous stream of ejecta, which might be caused by, by particles impacting on the surface? Or is this um, not continuous, episodic? Uh, it's episodic and we didn't see any pattern of um, repetition or whatever. Um, we went back uh, um, until December 2018, which was when we arrived to Bennu. So that's the date when we started to obtain images. And as I mentioned, we requested an extension of the orbital B uh, to be able to get more data. Uh, but uh, it was very limited because of the constraints. As you know, the missions have very tight constraints on the timeline. And analyzing all the images, these 300 events were, um, they were not even distributed in time. They were just episodic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, waiting if someone else wants to make another question, I have another one about the thermal modeling. You mentioned that the uh, thermal models predict a really smooth surface. And then when you go there, you, you found really uh, bigger material on the surface. How, how they explain that, the, the, mm. the modelers? Yeah, yeah, I say I understand your question. I don't have uh, really um an explanation for that because I'm not an expert and it is out of the of my expertise but uh, they, it seems that uh, they might be failing in the um, in some of the assumptions that you do mm -hmm. and and they think that um, some of the big boulders and or the or the big boulders that we observe might be covered by finer material which is somehow uh, cheating <laughs> the predictions from the models. But uh, actually one of the consequences of these findings is that they had to um, do a second thought and check a little bit some of the assumptions on, on the thermal models, which is nice because that's how science evolves. So mm -hmm. it's perfect. perfect, yeah. Okay. More questions for Julie. Okay. If not, okay, Isabel. That, that, that's a question coming from a complete or almost complete ignorant on this. So maybe, I mean, I don't know where it's very simple or very complicated. It, it may be hmm. something in between. I'm afraid well. so, of your question. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is how, from, from the point of view of the formation of those objects, what, what, what are you expecting? So where, are, are you expecting also from the formation, I mean, in dynamics and what, what is there is any simulation or whatever just to show you that you are expecting smaller uh, particles than bigger ones or what what are the implications from the origin of those objects mm, mm, i don't i don't think the sizes of the particles um, um well it's 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 everything. So the sizes and the distribution and um, also the composition. Um, so we normally think that the uh, smaller objects um, uh, uh, are covered by finer particles because of their own gravity is not able to retain uh, big, big boulders. I don't know if I'm, if I'm explaining myself. Um, and um, so you mean, I, I think I don't understand your question exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so the question is mainly if you, there, there is any simulation trying to form those objects, so agglomerating smaller particles oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, and if uh, and why you were expecting having smaller in this case, in, in terms of uh, such a formation processes, and uh, whether these result of observational resort to having bigger uh, sizes. Um, uh, if there is some implication uh, with respect to the possible origin of those objects. 
Well, the, the sizes are um, obtained from the uh, measurements in the thermal infrared. And, and to the, the, one of the things that you measure is the temperature and, and, and something that you call thermal inertia, which is uh, the reaction of the material to these illumination conditions. So the material gets the, um, gets uh, it, it, the, this, this, the heat of the sun and how it re the, um, so uh, how, it's, how, how it is re emitting this heat. Okay, that's a thermal inertia. And uh, this gives you um, an idea of uh, the distribution of the particles on the surface. And, and because you assume some certain sizes to get your model that explains your spectrum, okay? And, um, and this uh, has to be, um, these assumptions or this, uh, yes, it has to be revisited because uh, we didn't find what we were expecting. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure this will have some implications in, in, the, in the models or in the uh, simulations that uh, are done to, to explain how these asteroids are formed. But um, I don't have the details, and, and basically this is a very um, a good way of saying I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it'll be very interesting, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm pretty sure they have some implications, but it's, I don't have it on the top of my mind on this uh, formation mechanism. Uh, maybe, for example, maybe I can add something. I think uh, maybe it's a misunderstanding when we say modelers we say in the model modelers of the sig of the thermal signal of the asteroid. Yes, not, 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 yes, not the model of the exactly of the formation. Other other models. Okay. And... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, for sure. There are models that uh, simulate particles and how they aggregate because most exactly. of these asteroids are rubble pile. To that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and okay. I, well, actually, Adriano works uh, doing this kind of, um, of simulations. I'm not an expert on that. Um, but I'm not sure if this finding on the particle sizes has implications on this simulation. That's maybe mm -hmm. a good answer to your question. Okay. So I take profit to thank you again and, <laughs> and inviting you in person for next time. It'll you made me to, sweat in the very last have minute. You in 3D <laughs> <laughs> instead of 2D. Um, uh, and to thank you again. Thanks to you for this invitation. Um, and I hope you like it. Thank you very Enjoy. much for the talk. Yeah. Thank you.